Steve Norton has, is a certified lymphedema therapist for 20 years. He also has a school that teaches the lymphedema therapy. And, um, and for treating patients, he's seen lymphedema, as you know, often uh, in, in his practice. And then his therapist, too, he's able to teach some uh, about lipedema and get them educated so they can go out and educate the, educate the patient that comes through. We have a great, just a great honor that he is here. He's heart attack down. He has uh, volunteered his time, even though he's over at the other um, conference. So I'm going to turn the time over. To Steve Norton, an amazing man who does a lot in the Lymphedema world. It's it's just a great honor to have you. Thank you so much. That word is honor associated with me always makes me tingle and cringe. <laughs> that I that. Um, so why would a guy like me know anything about lipedema? Uh, I'm not a lymphedema expert. I've been doing it longer than most people in the United States. Uh, I've trained probably 60% of all the therapists in the country. Um, I've trained people in India, China, South Africa, all over Europe, South America. Uh, this is what I do. Um, and I love what I do. Uh, and consequently, treating lymphedema has made me fairly well-versed in lipedema because, as you probably know, um, you're seeking ways to make your limbs smaller. And lymphedema promises to make limbs smaller. And so without discerning further, you're attracted to resources that may be able to fill in some of your knowledge gaps and give you a smaller limb. Uh, so the system of therapy that works well for lymphedema patients is often sought out by people with lipedema. And having seen my first cases of lipedema pretty much out of the box, I was working in the first clinic in the United States that treated lymphedema. Uh, I was with Dr. Robert Lerner. Uh, I became his chief therapist. Um, and we had uh, 10 practicing therapists in one location. We had a two and a half year waiting list because people were so desperate just to get their lymphedema taken care of. Um, there was just nowhere for people to go. Um, and some subset of people that came for therapy had lipedema also. And so the challenge was to, and even Dr. Lerner wasn't entirely sure how successful we could be with CBT, the gold standard therapy, uh, as applied to lipedema. Could we promise great outcomes? Could we, uh, you know, rival the outcomes that we get with lymphedema, which are really pretty good. Um, and we certainly came to that harsh realization that you can only compress adipose so much, uh, but the fluid component responds very, very well. And so uh, I've been that guy who has had to have hard conversations and has been cried on and has even shared a few tears with people who feel uh, really, really distressed, misunderstood, mishandled, uh, that false promises have been made. Um, and it's, it's a tough position to be in. So um, whenever I teach lymphedema therapists, I usually go into pretty good depth about lymphedema um, because I think that they need to be far more sensitive than certainly the physicians that they probably encountered. I think therapists by nature tend to be more compassionate and perhaps have a little bit more time to spend talking and thinking and feeling, um, empathizing, and trying to strategize solutions. Um, but uh, oftentimes the physicians have been fairly dismissive. And um, so that, that kind of sets the stage here. So let me tell you what I know. And being sensitive to the fact that many of you here are <coughs> suffering with lipedema, um, I'll try not to be too clinical, uh, too cold, um, but also clear in what I know, um, which is based on really empirical evidence, right? That kind of clinical evidence that you gain from anyone doing this work, 
So these aren't just my observations. These are the kind of universal observations of people who see lymphedema combined with lipedema, and oftentimes lipedema without any edema yet. Um, this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is what it responds to. This is what it doesn't respond to. This is how it's mishandled. Um, that's what I can provide today. And an ongoing resource in myself, um, if you need me. Okay. So I show you this uh, slide here. <clears throat> this is actually an Egyptian hieroglyph of a person with lipedema. So it's in the genetic record. It goes back to the beginning of time. Uh, and I got this slide from a Dr. Uh, Strassenreuter, who is a German physician who uh, is deceased, unfortunately. Young man, um, passed away well before this time. But he was also passionate about lipedema and wrote pretty extensively about it. Uh, he and I have worked together and uh, shared some information over the years. And uh, I love this slide because it really just drives home the fact that uh, this body type has been with us. There must be something to it. Uh, it's not just a consequence of modern living. Um, so, yeah. And it's, I think, also really embraced and appreciated, too. That's very attractive in a lot of ways. Um, so, the overview here is kind of understanding the patient profile. Then the, the diagnosis. We tend to encounter four different variations of this uh, disorder in uh, lymphedema clinics, so we need to be able to tease out the differences. And then the CLT perspective, the certified lymphedema therapist perspective, uh, that's where I come in. Um, we are probably the best suited to give you good advice because um, we have a very sound background in treating uh, large limbs and when your immune system might be impaired and uh, the ways that the skin can change if you don't arrest the progression and the things that the skin and subcutaneous tissue respond to. Um, your sensitivity to touch, bruising, all that stuff. Alternative therapies, uh, self, sensible self-care, uh, and then a few final thoughts. So you know this already, but the physical attributes tend to be this short list here, um, nearly exclusive to females. Uh, if it's going to um, show itself, it's going to occur around puberty or sometime thereafter, not before some kind of link to estrogen, perhaps. Um, oftentimes, the key area of involvement will be pelvic press to ankles, not involving the feet, a bilateral symmetry. Uh, when we see an asymmetry, that makes us pause and say, OK, what's different here? Why is there an asymmetry? Lymphedema is asymmetrical. Um, bad veins in one leg will create an asymmetry. So there are combinations here that we need to think about. Soft skin te texture and low skin elasticity is a really hallmark. That's what makes it different from just kind of your garden variety of obesity or just kind of fat accumulation. Palpable adipose nodules and uh, progressive in nature over time. A tendency to bruise and hypersensitivity to touch. And oftentimes some prominent superficial veins. So those veins that reside in your skin um, they're not getting good support either, right? So loose skin kind of gathers you up. Your skin is supposed to gather you up and hold tight, almost like a garment would. When your skin is loose, then the valve structures and veins and also in lymphatics lose support too. And so we tend to see those veins getting gorged with blood. More in some people, less in others. Sometimes it's a pretty large feature of the overall clinical presentation. Um, Next slide, please. I'm a big believer, and this is kind of where I'm coming from when I talk to my students. Um, you have to understand that the, there's a real mental and emotional toll that this all takes on you. Um, you're not obese, although you've been told so. You should not be lumped in with the obese patient. Um, it's very hurtful to hear that when you know You've got all the energy in the world, and you would do anything to change your situation. You're not just sitting around, kind of, you know, watching it occur. Um, so you do not have an eating disorder. 
your body's metabolizing fat differently and food differently. Um, you're not lazy. On the contrary, you're a highly motivated person and you're eager to follow any medical guidelines that are given to you. So we need to be responsible with the medical guidelines that we provide because it's very easy to, with that ambitious mindset and the energy uh, to employ in any direction, we need to be careful that we don't misguide you uh, down the wrong path. But I can tell you, so many people that are treated with lipedema are absolute gems to work with. And I go, gosh, I wish that I could do more because you're just so on the ball and you're so um, open and so energetic and willing. And when we treat lymphedema, sometimes those people feel a little bit broken. They feel like, gosh, lymphedema happened to me. It's happened because of cancer, and my swollen leg reminds me of cancer, and that it may never go away. It might have a recurrence. And so lymphedema tends to be a very depressing emotional situation as well. And those people sometimes lack the motivation that someone with lipedema has. So whenever we see people with lymphedema, or highly motivated, we think, well, maybe they were born with it. Maybe they have that primary variation of primary lymphedema and secondary lymphedema, right? Primary lymphedema is that which occurs at birth uh, or for some unknown cause, probably due to just malformation of lymphatics. And so we treat little babies, we treat you know, little kids all the time that come into the world with this broken lymphatic system. And they're often very motivated too. They're really great patients to work with. They have a similar, well, I just got to get out of life. This is my karma. This is my path. Uh, let's make you know lemonade here out of the lemons. Um, but it's that secondary lymphedema patient where they had a perfectly fit and normal body that's now impaired, secondary to some major trauma, generally cancer. It really sets them back. So anyway. I'm always very appreciative for the, the lipedema mindset. Um, and I like to work with that. And then we have to be careful. We have to be careful not to guide you wrongly and dash your hopes in some ways. Um, so you often feel labeled misunderstood and dismissed. So anger and fear and depression and desperation oftentimes follow. Uh, and it can take a good long time before you get the sound advice that uh, you deserve to get. Covering up and limiting your body exposure decreases your life's fulfillment. Next slide. So accurate assessment provides comfort. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with someone um, and it's the first time they've heard an accurate diagnosis. And it's this bittersweet thing where, gosh, you know, what does that mean? But at least you know what to call it. And that's great. You didn't say I was obese and you didn't tell me I had lymphedema when I don't. Um, you actually know what you're talking about, and you have a word for this. American physicians have not embraced the word lipedema to the extent they could and, and will, uh, but certainly the European physicians have. They've, they've teased out this subset of um, fat disorder um, a long time before the U.S. physicians had. Uh, thank goodness for Dr. Herbst showing some light finally here in the U.S. Um, so accurate diagnosis then creates some distress uh, because the cures don't exist and conventional therapy is less effective. I wish I could stand here today and tell you I've got a magic bullet. <laughs> but I can tell you that we are in a position to understand how to safely and effectively take you to another level of improvement. Uh, pretty much guaranteed. I've treated a lot of people and they are always better off than when they came in. Um, so there's temptation to undergo high-risk risk treatments because there isn't that magic bullet. And so really depending on the person in a hear what you have to say and then just say that's not good enough. And uh, just like our primary lymphedema patients, their parents, so these little kids, they have parents who are mortified at the fact that they came into the world with uh, this swollen leg or a swollen leg and arm or two swollen legs, two swollen arms, swollen face. Sometimes the entire body is involved. Um, they're looking for a magic pill or a surgery. And uh, they will sometimes subject that little person to uh, a debulking surgery, which is horrifying. Uh, they just remove way too much 
tissue uh, in a system that we know already came into the world with less of what it needed. So taking away more really defies logic. Uh, so my little soapbox with those people is to say, listen, um, it just doesn't make sense for you to do anything radical. Uh, let's protect your child here and let he, him or her grow into her body, his body, and uh, let's do everything we can to contain the progression and maybe reverse the progression so that as they grow, they become less proportionately involved. Uh, so anyway, some crossovers in, I guess, the way that we view both of these disorders. Uh, there is certainly temptation to surrender to depression. It's not uncommon that uh, the person with leg edema will um, succumb, succumb to eating disorders and also slow down and just do less than they could and should. And it's all understandable to me, it really is.